representing the short people. Um, so I really wanted to speak with you today from this stage, but you may have seen me last night. I was dancing the Lindy just a little too long, and I'm sure my back was not going to be happy on the stage. So in the interest of patient safety, I thought I'd better stand up here. So Joe, thank you for this opportunity. And Chuck, as always, it's be an honor to be part of your action army. All of you in this room today are leaders in, in, system, in patient safety. And you've heard about three care systems that have been failures. Failure to rescue, medical error, and safe blood use. And all three of these failures changed my life. I lost a husband, and our nation lost an American hero. That's my guy. Awesome dude, huh? Pete was a test pilot. He was an astronaut. And he was a guy who Tom Wolfe wrote the first four chapters of The Right Stuff about Pete. He flew four flights in space, Gemini 5, Gemini 11, Apollo 12, and Skylab. He was the commander of the second landing on the moon and was awarded a Congressional Space Medal of Honor for rescuing Skylab, which was our first space station. And as you know, we've launched many space stations now and have a permanent presence in space. So this is Pete on his Apollo mission with Al Bean. They were the best friends. They took an all-Navy crew to the moon. And his motto was, if you can't be good, be colorful. And Pete was really both. And he brought people to him that really reflected all the multifaceted aspects of his own personality. He just loved people who followed their dreams and were good, honest troops, and people who had fire in their belly, just like all of you. And he wore his celebrity in a very humble and elegant way. He was really just profoundly himself. Now, his story wasn't without problems. Um, he was a kid who had problems reading and spelling, and he was thrown out of a prestigious school called Haverford School, and ended up with a scholarship to Princeton and a ride to the moon. I figured out later that he became an aeronautical engineer because you don't have to read or spell very much, so it worked very well. He was the storyteller, he was the raconteur, he was the cut up, he was somebody you wanted to have a beer with, he was somebody you wanted to hear his stories, and he was just a character. I mean, I guess you could say he was a piece of work. And he was. So when Pete landed on the lunar surface, I have a missing slide, uh, here we go. Those were his first words. Well, that was his first word. Um, and that was because he had just done a pinpoint landing on the moon, which you kind of really got to think about that. There's nothing to navigate with. And then, of course, they did this pinpoint landing, which made him really happy. And then, of course, his next words were, well, that may have been a small one for Neil, but it was a big one for a little guy like me, because he was the shortest guy in the astronaut office. So, you know, the other part of Pete was he was this great philosopher. I mean... He really understood the purpose of life, and that was just to have fun. And we had a blast. I mean, if you recognize that guy, that's George Lucas. And we traveled all over the world together, and we went to amazing events, and we just had fun. And we adored each other, and we worked together, and we flew helicopters from Arizona to Venezuela, and we just had all these adventures. And we laughed, and we loved, and we just absolutely adored each other. Well, on July 8th of 1999, I received a phone call that changed everything. Pete had been taken to a small emergency hospital and he had been involved in a motorcycle accident. And he was in this little hospital in Northern California, it's just like hundreds of them all over the country. And I drove toward that hospital and I called from the road um, it was a three-hour drive, and I was told by the doctor that Pete was in surgery, but that he was really in good hands. And when I got to the hospital, I asked to see the doctor in the emergency department, and she said, your husband is very grave. 
I was given no details. I was taken to a hospital room where some of the people from the motorcycle ride were waiting, and we sat there for hours and hours, and no one talked to us. Finally, this doctor comes in in his scrubs, and I'd never met him, and he didn't introduce himself. And he said, so which of you is Mrs. Conrad? And I, I said, I'm Mrs. Conrad. And he said, he's dead. And then he just turned and abruptly walked out. There was no explanation, no nothing. And no one ever came in to tell me why he died or how he died. And actually, the only one that reached out to me afterwards was a highway patrolman who was at the scene of the accident and was absolutely stunned that Pete had died because he was conscious at the scene. I later learned that Pete's death was preventable, that it was a failure to rescue, and it was a result of multiple system failures. And I have to tell you, I felt very victimized. And I alternated between feeling completely helpless and then mad as hell. And it just intensified the more and the longer I was left in the dark. And you know, we've talked about this and we've put a light on this today and I wanna share with you my feelings as well. And I appreciate you listening. They could have done three things, all those people that took care of Pete. They could have said what happened. They could have told me they were sorry and how their care could have been different. And they could have told me what they would do so it would never happen again. Now, Pete spent his entire life in these complex systems. They were dangerous, and they were built for high performance. And yet he died a preventable death from a huge system failure. The bad news is that Pete's course of care and the outcome could have been completely different if the leadership, the practices, and the technologies had been in place to prevent failure to rescue, prevent medical error, and to deliver blood safely. So the good news is, just this month, I mean, it's a whole crazy story, but I found out that Pete's story helped contribute to a dramatic change in trauma care in the community where he died. In fact, one of the physician leaders that helped drive this change is here in our audience today, Dr. Angelo Salvucci. Thank you for coming, doctor. So, you know, we know this. Our nation's healthcare is suffering from complexity and chaos in a time of huge cost pressures. And I decided not to sue and instead exert my energy and efforts to being part of the solution. And I've been doing this for many years. Things will only change with innovation in leadership, practices, and technologies. So, in the end, this isn't Pete's story and it isn't my story. It's our story. It's yours and it's mine and it's everyone who is affected by healthcare and we all are. So whether you're a board member, a CEO, a nurse, a doc, a benefactor, or a consumer, you have learned enough at this meeting to act now. This is not a think tank. This is a do tank and we are part of the action army. You know, some years ago, Chuck gave me the nickname Sparky. And a lot of my friends call me Sparky, and I want to tell you that this Sparky is on fire. And on behalf of patients all over this world, I want to commit to do everything I can possibly do to help the movement, Joe, that you have started, and to give patient safety its moonshot. And I'm very grateful to you. Thank you to all of you for stepping up, for caring, and for having what Pete Conrad would call the right stuff. Thank you. Thank you.